Um, okay, we are continuing with God's 10 rules for financial success. We've, we've covered the first five already. Uh, I'm going to try to get through um, the other five this morning. Uh, I don't think they, they don't take as long as I, I, I don't think, as long as I don't start meandering off down the road and, and getting too far off the outline. Um, and I've forgotten, did not print off the first page, um, and so I'm, I may have to refer to someone else that's been taking copious notes over the course of the last few weeks. The first rule that we covered extensively was obey God. That's rule number one. Rule number two is pay God first. Rule number three is pay yourself second. Um, rule number four is... <coughs> Hmm? Minimize. Minimize expenses and rule number five is work hard. Okay, so there's the first five and we've already covered those. Now we're going to pick up with rule number six, which goes kind of hand in hand with work hard. But you, you know, you can work hard and never advance. You can be the best entry level position that anyone has ever seen and always end up being at an entry level, never advance from it. There's something that goes hand in hand with working hard, and that's working smart. Working smart will get you farther than just working hard, okay? And what I mean by that, let me give you an example. In, in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 10, it says this, if the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. You try to try to mow a lawn with a dull lawnmower, it'll cut the grass, but not like it will if the if, if the edges has been has been trimmed. You can by brute force work your way through things, but if you use your brain it doesn't take as much energy as it does if you just brute force your way through it. And there are certain steps that you can take using your brain that are going to make you more profitable to your employer, that are going to make you more profitable to your clients, that are going to increase your own profitability by working smart and not just working hard. Working hard is important, but you got to have the smarts in there too. With both of them combined, then you actually have a, a, a much better chance. Um, over in Proverbs chapter 13, there's something that we see, and this is, this is very true. Um, Proverbs 13 and verse 23, you know, God takes care of us, but sometimes, sometimes taking care of us and doing better are two different animals. You can brute force your way through and get by, and you'll eat. You'll have a roof over your head. But if you work smarter and take advantage of some of the rules that I'm showing you, you'll do better than just eating and having a roof over your head, okay? Um, Proverbs 13, 23 says, much food is in the tillage of the poor. I mean, they have food. Poor people generally have food. But there is that that's destroyed for want of judgment. If you're not smart, if you don't use good judgment, if you don't work smart, if you just continue to make the same mistakes over and over and over and over again, yeah, you might have food. You might get by. But you, you lose the, the rest of it and you lose the advantage and unfortunately, eventually you get to an age to where then age starts playing against you. You know, I, I know there's not supposed to be age discrimination, but I've got a feeling if I went out to try to get a job right now, being almost 70 years old, I'm gonna have a hard time doing it. Unless it's something that I've done for years and years and years and I go out as a consultant. But if I decided tomorrow to go back to law school and be a lawyer, kind of chance am I going to get getting it? I'm, after a while, you better have set the groundwork by the time you get to be my age, because it's a little bit tougher then to start over again. I, I remember years ago, I remember w one of the things that, that we talked about, and, and this applies to guys 
more than it does women. Guys, you can, you can mess around until you're about 40, but by the time you're 40, you, you, better, you better be on your path. You better have figured out what you're going to do, and you better be on the way. Um, you can't mess around forever. You know, and now I, I ended up in a profession that I was very good at. Um, and I rose through that profession. It wasn't what I wanted to do. Had you asked me in high school, is that what you want to do for a living? I would have said, what are you, nuts? No, of course that's not what I want to do for a living. That's just how, where I ended up, and that's what I ended up having to do. And I was good at it. But it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, but I was at a point where I had two children in the house and a wife, and I had to put food on the table, and you gotta, you got to do what you got to do. Some, for most of us, that's the way life works out. But by the time you get to where you're in your 40s, guys, it's time to be pretty well settled as to what you're going to do. Then you got another 25 years to work before you're, before you're done. Um, and the, another thing that's interesting is that in some businesses, until you start getting a few gray hairs around the around the temples, you just don't you don't seem to really get very far. There are some people that do, but for the most part, if 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 you're in a financial business, you know, and you're dealing with people that are in their 60s and 70s, and you're 22, you're going to have a hard time with them. You haven't. It, it's kind of like. It's kind of like Ben used to talk about when he was ordained when he was 18 years old. That's kind of a rough place to be, to be 18 years old and, and to be an ordained minister in a church. And having to sit down and counsel with people and, and, and delve into marital issues when you've never even been on a date. Okay, you, you don't tend to want to open up with folk. Well, it's the same way in business. If you're in some sort of financial business, until you got a few gray hairs around the side, a couple of, you know, crow feet around your, around your, your, your eyes, people don't generally want to jump right into that cart. They, they want to know that you've kind of weathered it a little bit. Um, which is another reason why I say, you know, you can try this, try that, try some. By the time you, you're getting 40, it's time to it's time to pretty well zero in and and have your career path pretty well set. Um, in Proverbs chapter 12, it's interesting that we get a lot of this stuff from Solomon, huh? <coughs> Proverbs chapter 12. And verse 11, it says, He that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. Um, even if what you do is boring and dull and doesn't really bring a lot of joy to you, but you do it, and you do it well, there's success there. Even if it's not, you know, there used to be, when, in, in, when I was young, schools were different back then. They, they wanted to teach people how to work in industry. Um, you go into a school room today and you'll find they set the desks up differently. It's a whole different animal than it was when I was a kid. When I was a kid, they were all lined up exactly the same way and and they basically were teaching you how to go get a factory job and and take this widget and put it on the on the belt and do that for eight hours a day right or or, or whatever it was whatever assembly line kind of thing that they had going on it's what they taught people back then and and you know what that's boring dull stuff but I know people that have retired from doing boring dull stuff for 40 years and are financially set. So it might not be the thing that really tickles you on the inside, but there's money to be made. And that's one of the things that I think that, that our society today has really made a big mistake at. We've taught everybody that they need a college degree in order to get a job. And so we've sent everybody out to go get a college degree. We haven't trained anybody on how to be a plumber. 
We haven't trained anybody on how to work on air conditioning systems. We haven't trained anybody on any of the trade jobs that have always paid more than the white collar jobs have. I mean, auto mechanics make more than first year lawyers do. It's just that they get their hands dirty. But we've gone out and trained a society full of people that have college degrees and now, they're, now they don't want to take the, the job being the plumber because they've got a degree, but those are the jobs that we need. Those are the people that we need. Um, and, and it just it boggles my mind. But there, you know, there are jobs that, you, that people do that are, uh, God can make you rich doing them. Because remember, first and foremost, that's who you work for. And as long as you remember that that's who you work for and you put the effort into it as if you work for him, that's where the reward's ultimately going to come from. If he can control the hearts of kings, you don't think he can control the heart of your boss? He most certainly can. So work hard, work smart. Um, In Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 4, it says, The soul of the sluggard desireth and have nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Those that work hard, those that work smart, advance. Sitting around talking about it isn't going to do anybody any good. You're not going to make any money sitting around thinking about making money. You have to actually get out there and do it. You actually have to do the work. Um, and in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 4, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Those that pay attention to, uh, to things. So, I don't know, I jumped backwards on my outline. Sorry about that. We cover the same thing we did last week. You get it twice. Won't charge you anything for it. Um, <coughs> Okay, so one of the things that wisdom teaches is that whatever your position is, be satisfied with it and work hard at it and work smart. You know, the smartest thing you can do is make whatever position it is that you have essential. Make your, I have a good friend, um, I used to play in bands with him years ago, we reconnected a while back. He does the video um, for the court system in Ventura, California. So whenever they have a trial and they have, or depositions or all of that, he's the guy that does all of this video and edits all the video and I don't know exactly what he does but I know that's what he's, that's his, his job. And he's been talking about retiring. He's old enough to do that now. And, um, and they're going to have to hire four people. They're going to have to hire four people to do what he does. Because he has made himself so essential, they will never get rid of this guy. Why would you? If you take whatever job it is that you have and make yourself essential, your boss is going to be a fool to ever let you go. And number two, the money will eventually get there. And here's the proof of that. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. Now, it, when I say eventually, I mean eventually. It may seem like it took a lot longer than you wanted it to. But eventually it will be there because remember who your boss is. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, it says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You do what God says. Remember, rule one, obey God. 
You follow the instructions and you obey God and you humble yourself before God and you work as if you're working directly for the Lord Jesus Christ and eventually things will pan out. Things will work. So make yourself essential. Um, in Proverbs chapter 24, Verses 3 and 4. Through wisdom is an house builded, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and, and pleasant riches. It takes wisdom, understanding, and knowledge for financial success. Takes all three of them. And a wise man carefully manages his assets. Look at Proverbs chapter 27. Twenty-three and four. Proverbs twenty-seven, twenty-three and four. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. For riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation? You know, remember, we're talking about a time when people dealt in agricultural. That was, that was the money was in the herds. You, you go back and look at Abraham, and he was very wealthy. Why? Because he had all kinds of herds. A rancher takes care of whatever it is that he's ranching. If you have a cattle ranch, you take care of those cows. And if a fence blows over, you get out there and put the fence back up. And if one of your cows gets sick, you take care, you take care of it and you get it well. You take care of whatever assets you have. You manage your assets well. You don't just, you don't go out and buy 500 cattle head of cattle and stick them out grazing somewhere and just walk off and leave them and I'll be back in a month or two when they're big enough to slaughter, you won't have any left. You have to take care of them while you're going along. Same thing with your finances. You have to manage those finances just like you would, just like you would if they were cattle. Um, in Proverbs 14, 8, it says, the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. Do you understand what, how things are going to work out? Um, in Proverbs chapter 15, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 22, we read, without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. There was a book I read, and I don't remember the name of it, years and years and years ago. I got a lot of good advice out of that book. Um, one of the things that, one of the points that it tried to make was, if, if, you, want, if, you, if you want to be successful at whatever you want to be successful at, go talk to people that are successful at, at it. Go learn from them. Go find out what they did. How'd you do this? How did you get here? Unfortunately, what a lot of us do is we look at those people, and, but we don't ever go talk to them. And, you, and we end up gravitating around the people that aren't successful, thinking that someday we'll get successful. It's the successful people that know where the path is. They're the ones that know where the stones are that you're supposed to step on. The rest of us are out here stepping in holes. Those are the people that, that understand how you how you get there. Um, those are your counselors, folks. Go to the people that have proven that they know what they're doing and find out from them, how'd you do this? You're a millionaire, how'd you become a millionaire? And then, of course, if they cheated their way there, you're gonna have to change what they did because we've got another rule coming up. But if they did it properly, those are the ones that you learn from, those are your counselors, the ones that have already done it and have already shown that they know how to do it. Okay, and in the multitude of those counselors, you're gonna learn more. 
Um, you just will. In Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 18, it says, Every purpose is established by counsel and with good advice make war. Don't get involved in something without having good advice to start with. Okay? Um, we read over in Luke chapter 14. And this goes hand in hand with this. Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse 28. It says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? You're going to go out and build a house, it's kind of important to know that you got the funding to build it, right? You don't just go out there and pour the foundation hoping that, well, okay, we got a foundation, we'll come back to it in five years when we have more money and see if we can put up a wall. That's not how you do it. You make sure that you've got all the ducks in a row, whether you either have the money in your pocket or you've got the financing to do it. You, you don't go out and start these prob projects without making sure that you can finish the project. If you do, you look like a fool. And that's what Jesus is saying here. For which of you would do that? Look at verse 29, lest happily after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold him begin to mock him, saying this man began to to build and was not able to finish. You don't do, make sure that, that whatever this plan is, that, that it's going to work at the end. That there's a, you don't want to get involved in a business without ever sitting down and doing a business plan to, to re, because you might find out, you know what, this is a really good idea, but there's no market for it. So I could spend all this money and go out into this business only to find out that I, I just went broke. You have to plan these things, and good counsel is important. Um, and I'm going to say something that's going to sound controversial, but turn to Proverbs chapter 17. I know that, that right now a lot of people would take issue with this. I don't think anyone in this room would. Um, but popular politics would. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 2 says, A wise servant. Now that word servant refers to a slave. Okay? A wise servant shall have rule over a son. If I have a servant and he's wise, I may put him in charge of my own kid. You see the point? A wise servant shall have rule over a son that causeth shame, and shall have part of the inheritance among the brethren. The point is that the disadvantages of race, of color, of age, of sex, can all become overcome by wise work habits. We, you are not automatically stuck in a position that you can never come out of because of your race or your color or your gender. There are too many examples of people that have overcome it to prove that those disadvantages or so-called disadvantages can be overcome. They can, but it requires wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and applying these rules. Apply these rules, it doesn't matter if you're green. You apply the rules and you're going to have the same advantages that anyone else has. And it's the slothful men that are unwilling to manage opportunity. And the Bible doesn't have a lot of good things to say about the slothful. So you don't want to be, what you know, there was a, was it Geico? Was it a Geico commercial that had the sloth? You remember that commercial with the, and, and people were playing, what, what's that? What's, What's the charades or what a, he's drawing something and they're trying to guess what it is and it's a line and he and and all these hastily decisions being made and he's just takes that's a sloth that's the point of a sloth these, they don't ever get around to doing anything and the Bible doesn't have a lot of good to say about slothful people um, other than they're kind of funny to watch um, now, here's some, a, a few 
prudent room. Now I realize that we have some people in the room that, that have already pretty much finished their careers. So these are, this doesn't really apply that much to you. You're not going to go out and start all over again. And I wouldn't expect you to. But we've got some young people in the room too, and we've got people of all ages in here that that the, some of this does ap apply to. So I'm so this is directed at the young folks. Do you fully real fully realize and appreciate the standards that are used to measure somebody that's successful? Do you understand there's rules out there? And that you need to follow the rules and not buck the rules. There are some people that will become ultimately successful because they have a great idea, but those are few and far between. For every Steve Jobs, there's five million people that just work a job. Not everybody was is, is going to walk out the door and become ultimately overly successful like that. Most of y'all, I hate to tell you this, most of y'all are going to work until the day you fall over dead. That's kind of the way it, it generally works. Now if you're one of the uh, one of the one in five million, thank God for it. But if you're not, then there's some things that you need to understand. They're, and they're very, very important. Um, Image. In a professional setting, image is important. Um, do you understand that? Do you understand how important image is when it comes to a professional type of a setting? Now, we live in Lakeland, Florida. Um, rules are probably different in Lakeland, Florida than they would be in, say, Chicago, Illinois. New York City, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Um, in those cities, you better know how to dress. If you're going to be in a professional environment, individuality doesn't work. You cannot show up at a professional meeting looking like Cam Newton in a yellow suit. It's not going to work. You better know what the uniform is. And there is a uniform that goes along with just about every profession you decide you want to be involved in. I remember years ago, IBM, IBM computers would allow you to wear any color or type of shirt as long as A, it was white, and B, it had a button-down collar. Anything else you want, that's, but you show up at work in a white button-down shirt, or you don't show up. That was the uniform for IBM. And every profession has a uniform. You need to know what the uniform is. Indiv you know, one, one of the things that I find incredibly interesting is I, I've referenced Steve Jobs. You think of Steve Jobs, and you think of this guy that wears long sleeve t-shirts and blue jeans. Right? That's the picture that we have of Steve Jobs. Have you ever seen what he looked like when he was first getting Apple Computer started? He looked like Dr. Stuart Crane. He wore a white shirt, necktie, vest, three-piece suit, looked just like any other computer guy. Because that's what they expect to see. And when you start, you've got to start there. Um, that same book that I was talking about, and I don't remember the name of it, but one of the things that it taught was that dress for the job you want, not for the job you have. Now that doesn't mean that if you're a truck driver and you want to be a lawyer, you wear a business suit and a truck. That would just be foolish. But when you're in the, when you have the opportunity to be around the upper echelon of people that you're wanting to be with, look like one of them, don't look like the truck driver in that situation. Does that make sense? So dress for where you want to go, not for where you are now. And if dress is still important, which it always was before, then learn the rules. Find out what the rules are and learn them and pay attention to them. Um, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9.
You know, the Apostle Paul, there was something he was very, very good at, and that was doing his job in, in such a way that he could appeal to whoever he needed to appeal to, depending on the situation. In um, verse 22, he says, To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Depending on your crowd, depending on who, and, and we're talking about jobs here. So if, you, if, if you're in a profession and you're going to a business meeting with a bunch of other professional people, you better know what they're going to look like. Another piece of advice, this is for the guys. Okay, guys, don't let your wife pick your clothes for you. That's fine for date night. It's not fine for business. When it comes to business, do not let your wife pick your business suits because you will look like Cam Newton in a yellow suit and a black hat. <laughs> Women have a completely different eye for fashion than the, than the guys you're going to be sitting across the table from. That's fine. It's okay to, to let her pick your clothes for her but not when you're going to be sitting in a boardroom. When it comes to that, go talk to a guy that sits in a boardroom and find out what, you know, it used, it used to amaze me when I would go to the board meetings, and I made this comment one time, I'd go to the board meetings in Chicago, uh, and you'd walk from the hotel to the, to the office building, and everything you saw was gray, everything. The buildings were gray, the street was gray, the sky was gray, the sidewalks were gray, and everybody was wearing a gray suit. They all looked the same. No individuality. The only individuality was the guy wearing the Black Hawks jersey in the wheelchair at the corner that yelled at you if you didn't put money in the box as you walked by. Other than that, everybody looked the same. Well, that tells you something. This is what they expect to see. So don't be the guy with the feather coming out of your hat. You're going to stand out like a sore thumb. Know what's expected and give them what's expected. Those are standards that, that they expect to see. Um, and here's one, that's, here's one that, that might come as a shock to some. Um, apparent financial opportunities. When an apparent financial opportunity presents itself um, that counters God's will, it's not God's will. Okay? It might look like the best opportunity you have ever seen in your life. I'm going to cut a fat hog on this and I'm going to be able to live the rest of my life, but it's going to take me away from the church. Not God's will. You know, there's somebody else out there that wants to get you away from God's church. And he'll do, he'll wave whatever carrot he can in front of your face to get you to do it. It's not God's will if it counters God's will. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Understand what God expects. Now look at 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22 says this, Flee also youthful lusts. Now that is not the lust of a child. That is fleeing a lust when it first gets started. Before it, bef when the thought first comes into your mind, when it is youthful, flee it then. Get away from it then because, because if you don't, it'll take hold and you'll eventually end up falling into it. So get away from it when it's little. When it first starts to raise its little head, get a, flee it then. Flee youthful lusts, but follow 
righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. It's not God's will that you move off and go somewhere else because of some apparent or perceived financial opportunity. God expects his people to stay. You don't think he can make you wealthy in Lakeland, Florida? Of course he can. Follow the rules. You don't have to move off. And yet, it happens all the time. And, and you know what? I can speak this from, I would say this from experience. I did it myself. Wendy and I moved away from the church. We know exactly what can happen. Don't do it. It's not God's will. So there's an easy one. If, 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 I mean, if you want to do God's will and you have the choice A or choice B, and choice A pulls you away, well, you can scratch that one off the list and go to choice B. That is, if you want to do the will of God. Um, rule number seven, work patiently. Work patiently. Understand that things are not going to happen overnight. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 11. It says, wealth, is gotten, wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. There ain't no free lunches out here, folks. There just aren't. Understand that working patiently and not trying to get rich quick, but working patiently is the way that God brings about financial success. Um, being too hasty will bring about poverty. In Proverbs chapter 28, verses 19 through 22, we read, He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread, but he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. To have respect of persons is not good for a, for, for a piece of bread that man will transgress. He that hasteneth to be rich hath an evil eye and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. Get rich quick schemes. That's what, that's what we're talking about here. These, the idea of getting rich overnight. None of that ever pans out. And remember something, you are on, you're not of the world. It might pan out for somebody out there because they're not in here. But these are God's rules for God's children for how God's children are going to be successful in this life. So don't listen to the world's plans on how to go about doing on one of these get-rich-quick things. Um, let me give you an example. Multi-level marketing programs. You've all run into one of these at one time. Now, there's nothing wrong with many of those business models. As far as the business model is concerned, in many cases it's sound. If you're selling a product and it's a quality product, that's fine. We have, we have members of this church that are, they make their living on multi-level marketing, but, they're, but what they're selling is the product. The problem with, multi, the, with, with the lure of a multi-level marketing system is that rather than sell product, you basically put together a pyramid scheme. You're not really selling product, you're building downline. So there's no real product here. I just have this pyramid built below me and somewhere down there, somebody's gonna sell something. And once they do, I'm gonna get a piece of the action. Now you're looking at that as the business rather than selling the product. If you're selling the product and the rest of it comes along, great. But I've been to enough of these presentations, that's not, what, that's not how they sell them. They don't sell them first and foremost from the product being that good. They sell the business opportunity. And that is a form, in many cases, of trying to get rich quick. And usually, 
the only people that make it are the ones that started it to begin with and a few that they take along with them. And the, everybody else just gets suckered in. Now when it comes to, again, the product, if it is your business to promote the product and the rest of it comes however it comes, that's fine. But you don't want to get into the idea that I'm going to get rich off of selling this thing when there's really no product involved. I know there were a lot of people that made a lot of money with Amway for a lot of years. They had product. And the, those that sold product did pretty well. But then you, there were also those that, that never sold any product. They just tried to build downline, hoping that somebody else would sell product. Something's got to get sold or there's no money, right? If you're out selling the product, wonderful. But if you've got people down below you that you're hoping they'll do it, it's going to collapse on itself. And, and all of the effort is, is just going to cause frustration. So thinking in terms of multi-level marketing systems, again, the business model might be fine, but from the standpoint of selling product, not just trying to build a business and hoping somebody else is going to sell product. Does, it, does that make sense? Okay, so there's rule seven. Rule eight, minimize debt. Minimize debt. Proverbs chapter 22. Verses 26 and 7. Be not thou one of them that strike hands or of them that are sureties for debts, if thou hast nothing to pay, why should he, should he take away thy bed from under thee? We're told in Proverbs 22 and verse 7 that the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now the Bible does not forbid going into debt. It suggests that you don't. And it also teaches that Christians should be free um, over in... 1 Corinthians chapter 7, First Corinthians 7 and verse 21. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. In other words, if you're going to be a servant to the debt, it would be preferable to get out of the debt and be free. If you have that opportunity, use it. Debt is inevitable for certain things. But getting out of debt is the preferred status, not just staying in it forever, okay? Um, God considers debt a curse. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 15. Verses 5 and 6. Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow, and thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. You see, God intended his people to be the lenders not to be the borrowers because the borrower is a servant to the lender as long as they owe that bill. Now like I said, most of us are not in, in, in that type of a position that certain things we're just, you're going to have to go in debt for. At least, to, but, the, but the idea is get out of it when you can. I mean, you, okay, you purchase the home and you purchase it on a mortgage, 
pay it off and then own it. You buy a car and you have to take out a loan to pay on the car. Pay it off. Don't stay in debt for the rest of your life. Right? That's, God, that's what God prefers because I'll tell you something. Borrowing at interest will always cost you more than saving for something and paying cash for it without... It'll always cost more. And a clear sign of a corrupt society are tax laws that penalize thrift and reward debt. Take a look at us. Take a look at what the United States has done over the course of the last 30 or 40 years. There was a time where you could actually put money in a bank account and earn interest off of it and after about eight years or so, it would double. Try that now. What do you get out of what do you, what do you get out of a, sa a passbook savings account? Less than one percent. I remember I remember having money in one of those accounts. I stuck it in there and let it sit there for a couple of years. And I think on like ten grand, I made three dollars and forty cents in five years. It was just ridiculous. And that's teaching the American people why save. They're, they don't want you to, well that's the sign of a corrupt society, folks. And you know what, there, uh, I remember people making decisions based on, well I'm in an upper tax bracket so I need all of these different write-offs, so I need to be in debt in order to get, take advantage of the write-offs. You're fooling yourself. You're just robbing Peter to pay Paul. You'd still be better off to not have the debt. So what if you have to pay a couple extra bucks in tax? You don't have the debt chasing you around. Um, and while it's true that leverage can, can generate profits, it can do something else too. It can generate gigantic losses. The more you, the, the, the higher the rate of interest you're getting, the higher the rate of risk. That's why the interest rate is higher. So if you're getting a higher interest rate, it's because the risk is higher. And if the risk goes south on you, I see somebody smiling back there. You know what, you can go from being a millionaire to a pauper in about 15 minutes if things turn. And I've lived through enough of watching a market turn that, and, News flash, we're getting ready for another one of those. So be in a position where regardless of what happens, you can, you can make it through. Because if, if uh, we get another bubble pop, another 2008 rolls around and real estate values fall 50% of what they're worth today and you've got all your money wrapped up and it's all financed and, it's, and you've got no equity, because you just keep swapping things, you're, you're in to lose it all. Okay, so leverage should only be used financially if you can, if you can actually, actually afford to buy something outright. I had a friend that, he was a farmer, and every couple of years he'd go buy a new car. Um, and he, his credit was so good that he got zero percent interest every time he'd buy a car. Um, but you know, if something went bad, he could write a check and pay for the car. He didn't need the loan for the car. He just got it because he got it for zero interest. But he could write a check for it. So if you're going to use leverage and you got the money to pay it off, well then, what the heck? You're okay. But if you're taking everything you've got and trying to leverage something, well now we're back into the idea of trying to hastily get gain. And God considers that to be a sin. Um, and always remember that the more convenient the borrowing is, the higher the cost of the debt. If it's real easy to get the, the finance, it's, you're, it's going to cost you more. Think of a Visa card. Look, look at the interest on that as, as opposed to a personal loan. Okay. Um, now, borrowing is justified for those things that you would otherwise have to rent. You're going to have to pay for a house, folks. You're going to have to have a roof over your head. So 
if, if you're in a position where you can afford to buy, well then buy. Because at least that way you're building equity. Otherwise, you've got to rent someplace anyway. You're going to have to have a... So for those things that, that are needed, that you have to have, that you would have to rent if you didn't buy, well then, then borrowing for those is justified. But make sure that you make your payments timely. Psalm chapter 37 and verse 21 says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. If you borrow, pay it back and pay it back on time. Now, Romans chapter 13 and verse 8, we covered this when we were in the study on the book of Romans. We'll go back and take a quick look. I'm not going to go into great detail on this right now because I already did, but Romans 13, 8 says, O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. This is not teaching that you cannot have any type of debt. Some people will teach that, but that's not what it's saying. Life wouldn't go on if there were, I mean, how in the world would anyone ever purchase a home if you couldn't owe anybody anything? How are you gonna rent a house from somebody if you can't owe somebody, you own the rent? What it's referring to is that you take out a mortgage on a house and on the first of the month, you have a payment due, then on the first of the month make the payment. And now you don't owe anything on that again until the next month rolls around. You've met the obligations. So whatever your obligations are, meet them and meet them in a timely manner and get the debt paid off as fast as you can. Um, in fact, if you look at Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 3 it says a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself but the simple pass on and are punished it's prudent it is prudent to establish credit it is prudent to have the ability to borrow if the need arises itself that is prudent it's not prudent to charge yourself up to the your eyeballs and, and not be able to pay it off. But if, if, a, if some calamity comes along and you're in a position where you have to do something, well, it's prudent to have a good credit score, isn't it? So that you can at least go to the bank and get the money and pay and take care of the problem. You get hit with a huge medical bill, you need to do something. So that is prudent. It's just not prudent to Go into debt if you don't need to. Um, okay, how we doing? Oh, rule number nine. Rule number nine, work honestly. Remember that God searches the hearts. Work honestly. Put in an honest day's labor for an honest day's wages. One of the one of the things I remember years ago when Wendy and I were living in Reno and um, and I worked for a company that had to deal with United Autos worker people and I have never seen people work so dishonestly in my entire life as I did working with them. They would refuse to do their job as much as they could get away with. They were some of the most dishonest people I've ever seen in my life. They would just disappear. They'd just leave and still collect their paycheck, still get their pension, but they wouldn't put in a decent day's work to save their life. That's not working honestly. That's taking advantage. And God searches the hearts and he knows what you're, uh, what you're dealing with there. In Proverbs chapter 20, 
and verse 10 says divers weights and divers measures both of them are alike abomination to the Lord now what's a divers weight um, if you picture the you know the scale of justice the I don't know what the person is holding the scale and okay if if you bring me an ounce of whatever silver gold whatever and we put it on one scale and then I take a weight that is one ounce and put it here then the scale's gonna even out right so if you owe me an ounce of some an ounce of gold let's say and it, you don't have it in a coin you got it in a bag right it's just ground up and and you owe me a, an ounce for something so you put your ounce here and I put a three ounce weight on the scale you're gonna to have to give me twice as much those are divers weights those are weights where you're cheating someone where you're taking advantage of someone that's an abomination to God don't cheat folks be fair with folks in your business in your employment give them what they have coming if you offer something for a certain price and they give you the, the money for it, then give them what you promised them. Don't try to take advantage of people. Um, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 7, I'm sorry, Romans 12, 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. So if you contract with someone to do a certain job for a certain amount of money and you'll have it finished by a certain date, then you break your back to get it done by that date and you charge them what you told them you would charge them and you give them the quality that they expected. Work honestly. God sees that. Remember, he knows what's in your heart. And if, if you think, oh, I can take advantage of this guy, I'll just take advantage of him and get the money anyway, God sees it. And he considers it to be sin. Work honestly. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. And finally, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you that you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing work honestly don't try to get ahead using unjust means let the politicians do that their rewards coming someday. We're not to live that way. And that brings us to the last. Now I'll be sending this outline out and, and, and to be honest with you, I've, I've done a lot of slicing and dicing in order to get to to finish things off. So you're going to get the whole outline. You're going to get even the verse that I skipped along the way. So I'll, I'll get that out to you here in the next couple of days. Um, oh, one other point here before we get on. Be very, very careful with your business dealings when it comes to widows and orphans. Because God's watching. Exodus chapter 22. This is one of the things that you run into when you, when you live in Florida. Not that I'm a widow or an orphan. But in Florida... 
We're famous for telemarketers trying to sell everything under the sun and every scam that has ever come down the pike because there is a huge percentage of elderly people here that in many cases can get sucked into that kind of stuff. Be very careful of that. If you get involved in a business that is that that's your business model to take advantage of somebody, you need to find another line of work. God's watching. Exodus chapter 22 verse 22 you shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child if thou afflict them in any wise and if they cry at all unto me I will surely hear their cry and my wrath shall wax hot and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless don't take advantage of, of people that are elderly or don't have the, the same advantages. Um, and in Jeremiah chapter 22, In verse 13, we read, Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness, and his chambers by wrong, that useth his neighbor's service without wages, and giveth him not for his work. You say, what in the world does that mean? Don't take advantage of your brethren. If you're going to hire someone in the church to do a job, then pay them better than you would someone that's not in the church. Don't take advantage of people in here. Treat, your, I mean, it's one thing if you ask somebody, hey, can you get me a hand moving? You don't have to pay them for that. But, but take care of the people here better than you would take care of the folks out there. That's what God expects. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. Now, I don't think we have a situation in here where anyone has hired anybody else, but there can be a tendency where, well, I can hire this person in the church and maybe give them $2 an hour less than I would give somebody from outside, or don't do that. Don't do that. You're defrauding your brother. You pay them the same amount that you would pay someone from the outside. You take care of them the same way. In fact, you should take care of them better. But don't think that you're able to take advantage of someone and, and just because they're a member of the church. Make things level. Okay. Now, we're up to the last one, and this will only take a couple of minutes, we'll get it finished. Rule number 10, minimize risk. Um, like I said, I'm going to give you the outline, and we're coming up close here. So, uh, let me just make the major points. Don't, un don't assume unnecessary risks, okay? A surety ship, you know what a surety ship is? Sign them for somebody else putting my name on a loan for somebody else. That's surety ship. Don't get involved in those types of things, especially just avoid them like the plague. Usually if someone is coming to you asking you to co-sign a loan, it's because they can't get the loan themselves. If they could, why would they be asking you to sign for it? That's something that God expects you to avoid. Um, avoid gambles. And that's not just avoiding the hard rock over in Tampa. That's avoiding getting involved in something where, yeah, the reward might be huge, but the risk is also so big that I'm just throwing my money away. I might as well be putting it on a horse at the Kentucky Derby. Avoid those types of things. That's um, avoid ignorant investments bunch of them out there. Make sure that whatever it is that you're go going to invest in, that it's sound. 
Um, when it comes to surety ships, you, you have to consider the ability of not only your friend to pay, but of you to pay for it as well. It's almost like if you're going to loan someone the money and you loan it, there's many times when you just need to understand that you're never going to see it again. And if you can't afford to loan it and not get it back, then don't loan it to begin with. Because, there's, it, because if someone's in financial straits, are they going to pay you back? Or when they do pay you back, is it going to be worth what it was when you loaned it to them to start with? So try avoid those things. Don't fall for lotteries. Don't get involved in bingo or sit around and play poker. And that you just you throw money away that way. Yeah, you might win a buck or two. But I'll tell you something. Having lived in Nevada as long as I did, I can tell you, having watched people, that the people that win at the casinos, the reason that they win is because they lost. 15 times before they won something. We used to, we, Wendy worked for a guy that um, that would come into the casino, this was before we joined the church, he would come into the casino and and buy racks of $100 silver doll, they used to actually use silver coins back then, and we're talking 1986, so $100 in 1986 was a lot more money than it is today, and you'd walk in there, and, and th th they came in these red trays, okay? I'm seeing smiles of people that remember the red trays with the, with the silver dollars in them. Well, you walk in and you'd see the guy, and there'd be a stack of six, seven, eight, nine of these things that he has poked into this machine, and then the lights go off, and he wins a thousand bucks. And now everybody's happy, I won a thousand dollars. But it cost you 5000 to win the 1000 that you just... Like I've said, they don't build those casinos to give money away. And the, the odds are all on the house. Just avoid that stuff. It, you're just throwing money away. Um, I remember talking to a pit boss one time. And things weren't all that good at the time. The economy was kind of in in a rough spot and and I was wondering so so how do the casinos do when the economy is bad he said well we, we get rich if the economy is bad we do better than we do when the economy is good well why well because Christmas is coming and people want to be able to buy Christmas presents for their kids and so they take what little they've got and they bet it on the tables and they lose it but the casino makes out those, you know, avoid those kinds of risks. Avoid because you just you just throw money away. Um, be prudent of that. There, there are certain kinds of insurance that I've mentioned, and there are certain kinds of insurance that you probably need to have. Life insurance is one. Um, especially if you have debt, if you have bills, you don't want to die and leave your spouse a whole pile full of debt and not be able to put you in the ground. So if you're not in a financial position to be able to write the check for that kind of stuff, pick up a life insurance policy. It doesn't have to be huge, but at least take care of those final, those final things. Medical insurance. Um, this is what I'm kind of a stickler on. You really need to have medical insurance. Uh, even if you you know, even if you're going to pay cash, you get a better deal if you have insurance than you do if you don't have insurance. Uh, for us old folks that have Medicare, we don't have to worry about that anymore. But for younger people, uh, especially people with children, you need to have you need to have insurance to cover those things. Just ask the gentleman back there what it cost him when a, when a load of a tile fell on his foot, and uh, and see what the hospital bill was. One, one mistake, open the trunk, end up with four million tons of tile on your foot, end up in the hospital. It's not cheap. It's not cheap. You need medical insurance. Um, auto and home insurance to protect those things in case something happens. Car gets stolen. Somebody runs into it. Your house burns down. Insurance is important for that. Make a will. 
I remember in the military they made you make a will every time before you would deploy. Um, and you didn't have anything. <laughs> But it gets you in the habit of doing it. Make a will. Keep it current. Um, in, 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 these are things that just protect you because you know what? Something happened. Something happens to me. What's Wendy going to do? Well, there's documents that she knows where they are, and if she doesn't, I'll remind her that that have all this stuff in it. There's a will in there. There's a, um, a list of all of the accounts and all the passwords and all the stuff that she would need in case something happened. You know, one of the things I remember when my mother passed away, she had, we couldn't find any of this stuff. It took months just to go find paper. I remember her, she told me for years that she'd made all of the final arrangements at the, at the funeral home. No paperwork on it. So we ended up having to pay for it and worry about it later and figure it out. Make sure that all that stuff, that's part of just taking care of business. Make sure that if something happens to you that your spouse knows where everything is. That's, Wendy's been trying to get that information from her parents because they're getting up in, in ages. What happens if something happens to one of them? How in the world do you move anything around? How do you make sure that these things are taken care of? Men, that's your job as part of providing for, for your own. Um, make sure that something happens to you that the family can continue on and that they know where to go. They know where, they know where the policies are. They know where the passwords are. They know where the wills are. Um, they, they know where all that, they know how to get into the savings accounts. They know what the account numbers are. They know what you owe and what you don't. And, so that they can take care of those kind of things. Minimize those risks because you think about it, something happens and the other party has no clue. They may not even know that you have an account at Center State that you were putting a little bit of money in to save up for a rainy day. They may not even know about that. So it goes to the state. So make sure that, that, that you take care of that, uh, that they know how to, uh, that they know where the documents are. And just be responsible and, and maintain that and, and, and minimize the risks. You could end up losing a lot. Your spouse could end up losing a lot just because you never bothered to sit down and fill out the paperwork. And, and you know, I'll tell you something. That's not an easy thing to talk about. Nobody wants to talk about when I'm gone. Um, but it's important that you sit down and talk about when I'm gone. If something were to happen, here's where everything is. Have it set up so that they know, okay? Minimize the risk of losing everything because you didn't take care of it to start with. With that, I thank you for your very, very kind and patient attention this morning and for the past couple of weeks. Uh, let's stand and be dismissed in prayer and we will move on next week, Lord willing.